So I do not have a PowerPoint, but Joe mentioned the uh, missionaries that were here with us on Wednesday, uh, Chris and Anna Cozone. And so in honor of them, instead of having a PowerPoint, I'm wearing the PowerPoint for my sermon today. How about that? Yes. Run with purpose. Now, while that is not the title of my sermon, it is very important. Very important. Run with purpose. <laughs> so, this morning, I'm, I'm bringing a, a message, a word to us. The actual title is Born to Run. Born to Run. Um, always good to take notes because what you hear only, you retain, I think it's like 15, 20%. What you hear and write, you retain much more. I don't know the percentage. Uh, you know, maybe it goes north of 50%, something like that. What you hear and write well to somebody else, the retention goes way up, high percentage. What you hear, write, and tell someone else. So we always talk about this, but my prayer is that you guys have at least something, whether it's the salad dressing analogy or something, that in your conversations with people throughout the week, it'll trigger something in your mind because you heard it and you wrote it, and <coughs> now you have an opportunity to tell it to someone like, hey, what we're talking about right now, we talked about that at church on Sunday. Because the Bible is not some dusty book that was written so long ago that it no longer applies to life. We, each one of us has the opportunity to take the scriptures and uh, help people understand how it applies to their lives right now, today. Okay? So look for those opportunities, but prepare yourselves, potentially by taking notes. So, born to run. Uh, this was not in my notes, but it, I was reminded of it this morning that, uh, and maybe you're aware of this, but if you're not, your body is actually designed to run. <laughs> you may not feel like a runner. I'm not a runner. Everybody says that. Even runners say that. I'm not a runner. But physiologically, your body was created to run. I just heard this super interesting study. You guys know I love science. This study um, and the scientists, group of scientists, were looking at, uh, you know, because scientists in general believe that we, right, evolved over millions and millions of years. Well, how did humans survive? Because we're so pathetic when it, when you look at the rest of like the animal world, like we don't have large fangs, we don't have sharp claws, we don't have like exoskeletons to protect ourselves. Our babies are super defenseless, right? So in their minds, because they believe that we evolved over millions of years from other things, they're like, well, how did humans survive in the wild, <laughs> right? And so what they studied, and his, this guy's theory, is that we survived by being able to run away. Because our bodies, the way our bodies work, we may not be the fastest, but we're pretty fast, but we have endurance. There are other animals out there that, are fast, that would be faster than us and could catch us and eat us, but we can literally outrun them because of the way our bodies are made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen? But you were born to run. <laughs> you were created to run. So today, I'm going to be describing three types of people. And we're going to relate those three types of people into the context of running a race. Okay, I'm just giving you this so that you're able to track with me. Three types of people in the context of a race. And then we're going to connect that idea to Scripture. Okay? 
so that you can see yourself in Scripture. And that's going to give us an opportunity for an honest self-evaluation. So you can be excited for that. Now, I know there's always exceptions. There's always exceptions to everything. I'm describing three groups of people. Obviously, you know, you're not going to fall like exactly into one group or the other. That's fine. Don't get hung up on that. Just try to think about which one is the most similar to you right now, currently. So some of you, some of you woke up this morning and were like, yes, thank you, Lord, for another day. And you were just like excited for the possibilities of a new day, right? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand because you know the rest of us are judging you. But, <laughs> but you wake up and you're like, ah, oh, yes, a new day. The possibilities, right? It's exciting. You're ready. You're ready to run. These, these are the people, this is the people group that I'm calling the run to win group. They're up and at it. They're ready to win the day, right? At all costs. This day doesn't know what's coming because I'm going to hit it with everything i got, right? Some of you are like that. Some of you, this is group number two, some of you woke up this morning and thought, maybe it was just for a moment, that maybe it would have been better if you had not woken up at all. This is reality. You're the people who you didn't really want to get up at all today. Because those same possibilities, those same possibilities for today that got the run to win people up and excited, those same possibilities make you fearful. Because you've been hurt. Life has dealt you <laughs> a crappy hand. And you're like, oh man, it's probably just going to be more of the same today. Right? So it's safer just to stay in bed. Or sometimes you wake up with that feeling like, man, I feel like it would have been better if I hadn't woken up today. Some of you feel like that scientific study, like your like prey being chased and hunted. And so it's safer just to try to hide in your house or whatever. These are the runaway people. See, we were all born to run. It's just, how are you running? <laughs> are you running away this morning? And some of you are somewhere in between. You're like, I'm not really excited. I'm not really wishing I was, you know, not here. I'm somewhere in between. You're not loving life, but you're not really fearful of it either. You're not hating it. You're just kind of here. And you do what you have to do each day. I get up because I have to, not because I'm particularly excited about it. You know, I'm not saying me. That's just generally speaking for this group of people. You do what you have to do. It doesn't bother you that much, but you don't really get that excited about it either. It's just what you have to do. You're not really expecting anything overly bad to happen in your life, but you're really not that hopeful that anything great is going to happen either, right? <laughs> you're just kind of floating through life one day at a time. And I'm calling these people the run to keep up people. You're just kind of trying to hang on, you know, and people are running around you and whatever. And you're like, oh, like, let me just try to keep up with this person. You know, maybe it's your manager or your wife or somebody in your life and, or your kids. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep up, you know. So those are the three groups. Run to win, run away, and run to keep up. Can, can you relate to any of those three groups? Just give me a hand raise if you can relate to any of those three groups. And if you're starting to fall asleep, just stand up and shake your legs. Get the blood flowing. Okay, we're going somewhere with this. Anybody like to run? 
Yeah, a couple people. That's cool. The rest of us are just perfectly happy <laughs> to let you run um, <laughs> and, and, watch, and watch you crazy people do it. Um, but the really, truly crazy runners of the world enter themselves into these competitions and races, right? And maybe some of you have done that yourselves. And as you watch the race play out, you're going to see these three types of people in action. Run to win, run away, and run to keep up. Now, you might be wondering how run away looks in a race. Let me describe this. So, starting at the front of the pack, leading the charge are the run to win people. They're like, I got this. I'm not letting anybody else slow me down back there. I want to be out front leading what's happening. And if I'm out front, then I'm protecting myself from the melee that happens back there. Nobody's going to trip me. Nobody's going to bump me, right? That's the run to win people in a race setting. They don't want to be in the larger group because the group could slow them down. So sometimes, you know, it's like, get behind me so that you don't mess me up. Because I got a race to run, and I'm not going to let you slow me down. Okay? And this is the caution to those of you who are feeling like, yes, I'm a run-to-win person. There are times when God will call you to go it alone. And when he does, that's what you have to do. Even Jesus had to go it alone at times, right? There was a time, period of time when it says all of his disciples deserted him. All of his followers deserted him. But you have to make sure that God is calling you to go it alone. That's the challenge for the run to win crowd. Because it's very easy for the run to win people to want to be free and do their own thing and call their own shots. Amen. Okay? But there's a benefit to being in that position as well. And the benefit of that position is that you can control your own destiny a little bit more. You're not, like, stuck. You won't get caught in what everybody else is doing um, because you can avoid some of that chaos that happens behind you. Pros and cons. At the back of the pack, you're going to find the runaway people. Now, these are people, typically, who are still running. They're still running the race, but they've been hurt. They're not feeling well that day. Um... You know, dealing with an injury, a past injury, whatever. They've had to deal with maybe along the, the race, somewhere along the race. Um, they got a side stitch or their shoe came untied and they had to stop and now they're at the back. You, you understand what I'm saying? But sometimes it's also the runaway people who feel like, well, I'm just here. There's no way I'm going to win. So my goal is just to avoid, I'm not trying to be out front because I'm not skilled enough to run with those people. I don't want to be in the big crowd, right? Because that's just, uh, I've been hurt before by being too close to other people. I'm just going to stay back here. I'm going to run the race and I'm going to finish, but I'm totally okay with protecting myself and just staying at the back. You see that? The runaway people? Then there's the main group of people, which the French call the peloton, which literally just means small ball. <laughs> and this is the concentrated group. And this is where you actually find the majority of the racers is, is in the, the group, in the pack. And this is where many people find themselves in life, the run to keep up life where we're part of the crowd we're going with the flow we're doing what our friends are doing we're not really winning but we're not really losing either we feel good because there's still people behind us right like well 
I may not be at the front, but I'm not at the back either, so I'm good. And the benefit to this position is that it's easy and it's safe because you're part of the crowd. You don't have to stand out. You don't have to be exceptional at the front and you don't have to feel like a failure at the back. In this position, you also don't really need to think too much for yourself. You don't really have to pray about things too much because you're just kind of doing what everybody else is doing. Just go with the flow. Right? You're not trying to stand out. You're not trying to do anything that would make you stand out from the crowd. Right? You're just trying to keep up and do what everybody else is doing. So does that make sense? The three, three people types in the context of the race? Run to win, run to keep up, and run away. <laughs> now, some of you may have noticed this uh, in recent years, and some of you may have heard people talk about it, and some of you may have experienced it, especially if you have kids that are in sports uh, or in school. But there seems to me to be this prevailing trend recently of trying to limit our kids exposure to failure. We don't want them to experience failure in anything that they do. So in our desire to make them always be happy and never feel like they've failed, we don't keep score in sporting events. Uh, there's no winning or losing. It's just you're all winners because you participated. Right? And I get it. I understand where that comes from. You know, it's out of parents' desire to have happy kids. Like, I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just pointing it out. Um, and <laughs> there's, I don't know if you've heard of him, but there's a Christian comedian called, uh, his name is John Christ. And if you haven't, <laughs> check him out because he's hilarious. But he does this little uh, stand up bit about this phenomenon. Um, and really, really skewers it and puts it in, in a, uh, a way that is easy to understand. And you're like, oh yeah, never really thought about that before. But the everyone is a winner concept, no matter how much effort you put in. So the reason why I'm concerned about this is I think this idea of always winning is beginning to affect our society in profound ways as these kids never tell you and expecting everything that they do to be a success. Well, I showed up. Shouldn't I <laughs> shouldn't I win? Like, shouldn't I get a promotion? I showed up. I did my job. Maybe I wasn't exceptional, but I should still get an award, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course. But here's my main concern within the context of faith. I'm concerned that not only are we raising a generation of followers of Christ who feel like they can just have a side dressing of Jesus and be good enough versus running to win. And we're going to talk about what winning is and is not in the kingdom. So don't get nervous. It's not a competition like we think about. But my concern is that by teaching our kids this concept of always winning, in a faith perspective, we're, we're teaching them, which means we're actually believing it ourselves, right? What you teach your kids, you believe yourself. Or you wouldn't teach them, right? Right? I mean, let's keep it real. Some parents teach their kids that Santa is real, even though they know the truth. But we'll talk about that another time. But I'm concerned that we have, I'm concerned that we have a generation of, of believers who are growing up feeling like there's no need to live a consecrated life, a holy life. I can be good enough, right? 
all I have to do is show up to church and maybe I know some Bible verses and I go to youth group and whatever and I'm good, right? I'm going to win. That's running to win. I'm concerned that they that we're teaching and, and they're believing that there's no need to live in reverence of a holy God, to have that reverent fear of the Lord that the Bible talks about. That there's no need to give your life completely to Jesus, like Pastor Joe mentioned earlier. And that there's no benefit to upholding some of these things that Jesus modeled for us. If you're here for the Patterns series, I feel like we're undervaluing these things that Jesus modeled for us that we should uphold. Things like studying the Word of God, prayer, being baptized, extending forgiveness, Mercy, grace, love for all people. I'm concerned that we've accepted the idea that we can be lukewarm towards God. And still receive all the benefits that Jesus paid for with his life. When God clearly warns us in his word. In Revelation 3, 15 through 16 and 20 through 21. Revelation 3, 15 through 16 and 20 through 21. This is God's warning. He says, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat on my father, with my father on his throne. See, I'm worried that we're teaching that it's okay to do anything less than run to win. That it's okay to be lukewarm. That it's okay to give some of your life to Jesus, but keep other things back. And it says, those who are victorious. So what does it look like to live a victorious life with Jesus? What does that even look like? I think that's a question that we all need to ask the Lord and listen for his response. But Paul in his writings, in his letters, often talked about life like a race. He related life to a race often. And in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25, Paul says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? See, everyone's running. You're all running. I was just talking to Evan this morning, or Evan was talking to me, talking about in business, he feels like if you're not moving forward, you're moving backward. We're all running. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? <laughs> so 
so run to win. That's what Paul says. Run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. That's where winning becomes different in the kingdom of God than in the world. We run to win an eternal prize. He says, so I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Training it to do what it should. He disciplines his body. So discipline. What does that look like for an athlete? Discipline. It means they order their lives in such a way that points them towards the goal. They don't do whatever they want or whatever's convenient and expect to win the race, right? They work backwards from the destination and say, okay, if this is my goal, how do I need to live now, today, in order to reach that goal? Now, we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? That no one comes to the Father except through him. So this is not a message of works. And you just need to work harder and earn something from God. No. God has already done it all. But Paul says that he disciplines his body. He trains it to do what it should. So how do we discipline our bodies and train it to do what we should? It's those things like studying the Word of God, prayer, receiving baptism. If you've accepted Christ into your life and you haven't been baptized, then let's make that happen. If you haven't received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior yet, let's make that happen today. Right? Why wait? Tomorrow's not guaranteed. We'll have time at the end hopefully, for that. But those are the things. Extending forgiveness to people, mercy, grace, these same things that you received. Discipline yourself. Train yourself to do the same things that Jesus did. It's not work. It's not, I have to do these things so that I can blah, blah, blah. It's, thank you, Lord, for doing all these things for me and giving me the opportunity to do them for others. Freely you have received Freely give. Yeah? So, what does it mean to win as a Christian? Honestly, this was the biggest question that I had when I felt like the Lord gave me this word. I'm like, well, run to win? What, what does that even mean in the Christian life? Like, isn't it already done? Jesus said it's finished. What can I possibly do <laughs> to win? Like, if, I, if at the end of my life, whether that's five minutes from now or 50 years from now, and I stand before God, if he says, well done, good and faithful servant, I've won, right? Isn't that the eternal prize? Come and, and receive your inheritance. That's winning. So, how can I, right, if that's, the, if that's the destination, if that's the goal, just like an athlete disciplines themselves and trains, okay, if that's my goal and I back up to today, how do I live today? Am I reading my Bible? Am I praying? Am I talking to the Lord? Am I, having, am I maintaining a relationship with Him? Am I forgiving people around me that I need to forgive? Am I letting go of the past? All these things. And why? Why would Paul tell us that winning should be our goal? Is it just me? I mean, does that strike anyone else as odd? That he would say, run to win? 
Because doesn't that kind of imply that other people are going to lose? Not necessarily. See, we've been so conditioned to assume that if someone is winning, everyone else is losing. Right? Because that's the way it works. Like, if I win, you lose. <laughs> we can't all win, right? But that's how it works in the world. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, you can help me win, and I can help you win, and we can help other people win, and we can all win. If there was ever truly a win-win situation, it's in the kingdom of God. I would venture to say it's really the only truly win-win situation. Because any win-win situation that somebody offers you in this life, they're making sure that they get theirs, right? <laughs> Usually it's not like a totally altruistic, like, I just want to help you. Like, there's something that they're going to receive from it. But in the kingdom of God, we can truly all win, even though we're not all running exactly the same race. That's the other reason that we can all win and we can all help each other to win, right? I can run, you can run, and maybe... Maybe God has, you know, a different plan for, for you and for me. He's called me to certain things. He's called you to certain things. He's called all of us to certain things. We're all running. So we can all help each other to win. Isn't that cool? So don't go alone. You're called to run to win. But don't run alone. There's two things that Jesus said are most important in life, and that's that we love God, and I'm oversimplifying, love God and love people, right? He said that it all hangs on those two things. And that means that if we want to run to win, we need to help as many other people win as possible. That's really winning. Just getting to heaven by yourself is like, okay, you made it. Praise the Lord. But helping as many other people to win the eternal prize as well as you possibly can with every moment and every breath and every day that God gives you, that's really winning. Because now it's not just you. Now, multitudes of people are winning. Praise the Lord. Paul also says in Philippians 3, 13 through 14, I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. So, we talked about the run to win people and how, if that's you, you need to keep it in mind that just because you're running to win doesn't mean that the people around you need to lose. Help everybody win. If you feel like you connected more with the runaway people, then you need to listen to this from Paul and forget the past. Because it's those past hurts, it's those past things that are keeping you from running to win. And that's why Paul says, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because it's Jesus who heals those wounds, those past wounds. It's Jesus. 
So allow him to heal those wounds today so that you can run to win. My wife uh, shared with me this great quote from Christine Kane. And you're going to want to write this down if you are identifying with the, the runaway group of people. She said, don't make what people did to you bigger than what Jesus did for you. I'll say it again. Don't make what people did to you bigger than what Jesus did for you. Forget the past. Let Jesus heal those wounds. Get yourself focused on what lies ahead. And if you felt like you identified with the, the bulk of the pack, <laughs> the run to keep up crowd, then you need to look ahead, look forward. Now, think about it. Can I get, uh, just for fun, let me get all the guys in the room. Just meet me up here on the carpet. Quick, stretch your legs, get the blood flowing. Isaiah is a runner. Okay. Now just form, the French call it peloton, right? Small ball. It's, it's tight. Just get in tight around me. Tight. I know we're guys, but it's okay. Just act like you like me. Come on. Bring it in tight in front. Nobody has to see oh, me. Front. Bring it in. Oh, yeah, big guys. Rules. No, no, no. You're good. We're all going to face the same way. <laughs> we're, we're running. Pretend. Come on, guys. Pretend we're running a race. Bring it in, Joe. There we go. Nice and tight. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm a uh, run to keep up person, okay? And I'm in the crowd and we're all running, right? And I'm, I'm not hung up with, with my past, right? But I'm trying to look ahead. I'm trying to see what lies ahead, right? And some of these guys like Evan and Joe are much bigger than me. So what, what do I need to do? Run past him. Get him. <laughs> she said trip him. <laughs> no, I need to get out of the pack. I need to get out of the pack. I need to stop. I need to stop looking at what everybody else is doing and just following the crowd. And I need to get my eyes on what God has called me to do so that I can run towards it. Because it may not be exactly, the, other than eternity, it may not be exactly the same as what you guys are running towards, right? But if I stay here, if I stay here in the middle of the pack and I'm just like, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? Okay, you're, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm keeping up with these guys. I don't have to win, you know, I'm good. Then I can't, I can't stay focused on where I need to go. Thank you guys. Good work, good work. Run your race and bring as many people with you as you possibly can. Ah, amen. Uh, Sarah, would you mind just coming back and, and blessing us? I want to give you guys a quick example of a, a person. Um, there's many, 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 many. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, right? But I want to talk to you about one in particular. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich uh, wrote many books. And I'm thankful for those books. And, you know, they've been a blessing to Christians for many, many years. But I'm not here to talk about what he wrote. I'm here to talk about how he lived his life. How he ordered his life because of the race that was given him to run. He looked at the goal and he said, if this is the goal, how should I live? And he was in Germany at the beginnings of the Nazi uh, regime coming to power. And he actually left for a period of time because he was like, I'm having no part of this. 
it's wrong, he spoke out against it, it's wrong, I'm, I'm out. But then when he heard about what was happening and how awful it was becoming, he went back. He took the, he was here in the States. He took the last ship sailing out from the United States and went back because he felt like if this is what God has called me to do, how can I stand by and watch while other people suffer and die? And a friend of his wrote about him. He said, not that he believed that everybody must act as he did. See, Dietrich understood that we all have our own race to run. And he wasn't trying to put his conviction on anybody else, but he had to do what he knew God was calling him to do. He said, but from where he was standing, he could see no possibility of retreat into any sinless, pious refuge. The sin of respectable people reveals itself in flight from responsibility. He saw that sin falling upon him and he took his stand. Hmm. Dietrich was arrested. He went, he went back to Germany and the church had been forced underground. <laughs> at that time and he traveled around and tried to encourage the believers um, and he continued to write uh, until he was found and uh, arrested um, and put in prison and even then he was treated well he was still allowed to write they took his letters out but as things grew more and more intense, Dietrich was transferred to one of the concentration camps. Uh, I forget which one. Floss, Flossberg? Anyway, Flossenberg. And while he was there, he did the same thing. He brought people together. He encouraged them. He taught them the word of God. He prayed with them. And one of the one of the people you can go ahead whenever you're ready, Sarah. One of the people who was with him in that camp. I should say Dietrich was executed days before or very short time before sorry. No wonder you were waiting. Yes. Dietrich was executed a very short time before the Flossenberg camp was liberated. But one of the, one of the men who was there with him, uh, who was an English officer, wrote about him. He said, Bonhoeffer always seemed to me to spread an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the least incident and profound gratitude for the mere fact that he was alive. Dietrich was running his race, but he was all about taking as many people with him to that eternal prize as he could. And that's what I want each one of us to leave here inspired to do. He was one of the very few persons I have ever met for whom God was real and always near. On Sunday, April 8, 1945, Pastor Bonhoeffer conducted a little service of worship and spoke to us in a way that went to the heart of all of us. If you were here last week or if you watched the sermon, remember, I was talking about Jesus always went for the heart. Jesus always looked at the heart. And that's what Dietrich did. He found just the right words to express the spirit of our imprisonment, the thoughts and the resolutions it had brought us. 
He had hardly ended his prayer when the door opened and two civilians entered. They said, Prisoner Bonhoeffer, come with us. That had only one meaning for all the prisoners, the gallows. We said goodbye to him. He took me aside and said, this is the end, but for me, it is the beginning of life. The next day he was hanged in Flossenburg. Last week, I talked about that new life and how Jesus was raised up to new life after being in the tomb for three days and how we can have that new life as well. That we can live that new life. And Paul talks about that new life and how we should live when we belong to Christ. In Romans chapter 6, Paul says, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So you should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ. Paul says, do not let sin control the way you live and do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. The salad dressing. Use your whole body, your whole life as a tool to bring as many people into eternity as possible. God's going to give you guys opportunities to talk to people this week. Keep your eyes on the goal. Run to win. Not just to keep up. Not to stay safe and protect yourself. Run to win. Give God everything. <sighs> Amen. I want to have, I want to give an opportunity for us to pray. Um, the, the front is open. You don't have to use the front. Uh, it's just the easiest way for me to <laughs> see you and pray with you. But looking at those three types of people, I want to offer to pray with you if you're a run-to-win person, but you feel like you've left other people behind. And you see that, and you want to get that right and bring others along with you so that they can win also. If that's you, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you if you feel like you're one of the runaway people and there's past stuff there that you need to let go of, right? Letting go of the past. I want to pray with you, if that's you, so that you can run to win. And I want to pray with you if you felt like, yeah, I'm one of the run to keep up people, and I haven't had my eyes fixed on Jesus. I've had my eyes kind of on all the earthly stuff that's around me. If that's you, I want to pray with you. So if that's you, if you're any one of those three people, why don't you come while Sarah ministers 
There's no shame. There's no judgment, no condemnation. We're running together. So let's pray together that we can encourage one another. So if that's you, why don't you come? But the most important thing that we can do as as people make their way forward, the most important thing we can do here today is to offer to you, if you have not given your life 100% to Jesus, you can do it now. If you've had the Jesus salad dressing on the side, so that you could control what parts of your life had Jesus in them. And you're ready to say, you know what? I'm done trying to control everything and I'm, I want Jesus in every part of my life. If that's you, you're the most important person here today and we wanna pray with you that you could receive Jesus all over your life and be a part of you giving everything to him. So if that's you, come. Come and let me know and we will pray with you.